Hello, my dear friends. How are you? I hope I find you all in good health and safe and sound. I'm Ari Theriger, and today I'm going to talk about animism. Where do we stand and where are we going? This is our very first video of 2021. Uh, I thought that animism would be a good way to start the, this year, this new year. In fact, I have half a mind to make all the videos of January about animism precisely. Uh, you see, <laughs> back in October of 2019, I was recording the first videos for 2020 and I felt that the strongest sentiment we would need in 2020 would be hope, which is precisely why I have started 2020 with videos concerning hope and reinforcing that sentiment. And indeed, I have also closed that same year, 2020, uh, with another video expressing the necessity to, to hold on to hope and be hopeful. So I'm doing the same thing right now. Uh, back in the summer of 2020, I was already planning uh, the videos for this year, for 2021. And I thought and felt that for this new year, after the roller coaster 2020 had been, the best way to start this new year would be precisely by uh, changing our worldview and be a lot more aware of the, of, of the world we live in not only to embrace and uh, respect life, but also to understand that no life form is above or below anything. And in truth, we are all inserted into the same multidimensional, ever-changing organic reality. Not only do I try to follow my instincts, <laughs> but I also try to spend as much time as possible observing the natural world, nature, and uh, many things can be perceived, indeed. So again, I believe animism would be the right approach for this year, just as hope was in the past year. Well, of course, this doesn't mean that you should let go of hope, completely abandon hope. No, hope is the last thing to die, and for as long as there is hope, there is life. But now we also need to understand that life and what being alive truly implies. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm afraid this video today will be a little bit boring, I'm well aware of that, but take this as yet another introduction to animism, but this time on another point of view. First, I'll talk about the evolution and the development in uh, the attempt to understand animism, uh, not, ne not necessarily starting from a prehistoric past until our modern days, but instead speaking about the understanding of animism from the Western cultural point of view, from the, West, the point of view of the Western societies. So we might better understand where do we stand on the understanding of animism and the steps being taken to reach awareness and indeed truly understand animism. I would dare say that in the past 200 years or so, uh, there has been several attempts to understand animism from the part of the Western cultural world, the Western societies, and the great majority of those attempts are, at the very least, unsatisfactory, unacceptable, inappropriate, and inadequate. Animism has been regarded for far too long as something quite primitive by the Western society, who has always failed to see other cultures from an impartial point of view. Our Western societies have regarded animism and the belief systems of native peoples, even of the European pagan past, as, as, as something unsophisticated, archaic, primitive, ignorant, and even naive and childlike, when compared to the religions, politics, economy, and social lives of the Western societies. Uh, there's been for far too long uh, from the part of the Western societies, uh, even in the academic field, sadly, and especially in the academic field, um, there's been this perspective of standing on high ground <laughs> and watching native peoples playing with sticks and stones down below, uh, worshipping idols and talking to trees. Well, many academics, many scholars, many uh, ethnologists, anthropologists and uh, archaeologists of the past mostly amateurs 
truth be told, lacked the capacity of seeing animism and the belief systems of native societies from a totally unbiased point of view, either being judgmental by comparing it with their own cultures they were more familiar with, and uh, well, such cultures they thought to be quite advanced and sophisticated, or making comparisons from what they knew of their own societies and trying to apply the same perspectives, the same line of thought, concepts and beliefs, trying to apply that to the animistic societies they tried to comprehend. Now, the terms primitivism and primitive are very ugly and bad terms, not only when we speak about native peoples, but also when we speak about their belief systems, right? The Western society, sadly, has been uh, detached from an animistic worldview for many centuries. In fact, uh, I would even suggest that the, this detachment from animism began when we progressively and slowly started to be a lot more sedentary. The first steps into creating an organized society, the first vestiges of urban planning, the first structured systems of governance and hierarchization of the society. So progressively, slowly detaching itself from animism in the past 6,000 to 8,000 years for the Western societies. Uh, we have been progressively abandoning an animistic worldview since the Neolithic, and I still maintain my belief uh, that indeed the Mesolithic, uh, for the Western societies at least, was the last period when humanity uh, truly lived in harmony with, with, with nature and uh, was still very much preoccupied in maintaining a balance to avoid catastrophe. But of course, with the abandonment of paganisms from the late Iron Age onwards, that still contained animistic traces and adopting monotheistic religions that not only focus on the fervent need for the veneration of a deity, but also being world-denying views, always aiming for a spiritual reward away from this world and after death. Well, uh, the Western cultures almost wiped out the last traces of animism. Religion became sophistication elegance, education, the illusion of the refinement of the human mentality towards the spiritual. So, in this self-illusion of being sophisticated and far more advanced, the Western society looked down on those who still held on to their native faiths and their animistic worldviews, including the, the, the pagans. This sense of superiority was augmented by colonialism, and the subjugation of native peoples, and the attempt to destroy them, not only physically and mentally, but also spiritually speaking, by introducing them to new languages, new conceptions, new terms, um, and, and introducing them to other religions which the Western society thought it would be simply bringing civilization onto these people. So, this has been our understanding of animism and for over a century the studies on animism have always been from the part of those who no longer felt attached to animism or indeed no longer understood it anymore because it simply doesn't fit into their daily realities, their world views and every belief they have grown up with concerning the, the perception of a civilized and sophisticated society. Animism has been seen by the Western society as purely an imaginary delusion or a manifestation from the part of native people seen as primitive and their inability to distinguish dreams from reality. Many things have been written, many studies, many scientific works even uh, have been made concerning animism. All from the wrong perspective, which is why it has been very, very hard to take animism seriously, precisely because we have a hard time of letting go of Western perceptions of the religious and the social, but also the ideas we have of a more metaphysic ideology and constantly comparing 
such understandings <laughs> over indigenous understandings. It's time to abandon the old studies and start to take a step forward towards a true understanding of animism. Not only making the effort uh, to, to see past our cultural constructions, but also incorporating the worldviews of indigenous peoples uh, themselves, incorporating those views, making them part of the studies, immerse ourselves in their world. I, I think it, it is the least we can do after forcibly pushing our world into them. The effort to understand animism is of the utmost importance, in my opinion. What must be done, I think, is a rejection of previous scholarly attempts to identify animism as either metaphoric or as a delusion caused by the inability to abandon a childish view from the part of primitive minds. There's nothing whatsoever that demonstrates that certain minds are less than others, that certain peoples are less intelligent or incapable of evolving. Just because the daily reality of a people is different than the reality of others, doesn't mean they are wrong or right. It doesn't mean they are better or worse. And it doesn't mean they are irrational or wise. It's only a question of perception and be aware of that perception. Immerse ourselves in that perception and understand it. So <laughs> this is what I, I want to approach today. So we may understand where we stand on, on our perception of animism and what must be done to reach awareness in relation to animism. Because our lack of understanding of animism and uh, the difficulty we have to comprehend it is precisely because we are still attached to a worldview that is completely the opposite to the worldview within animism. So let's first start with the attempts that have been made to understand animism. Uh, and then I shall speak about other things that I hope may prove to be useful on the understanding of animism. Please. There is quite often the idea that animism constitutes the basis of all religions or that it is somewhat the foundations of more complex systems of belief, which gives the perception that animism is some sort of a false start or a crude prototype. Animism is often used as a label applied to all or most indigenous religions, often presented as primitive or indeed as a primal layer in which more advanced cultures or religions may be constructed. So this initial pejorative perception of animism already imposes um, a preconceived idea from which it will be very hard to get away from because we will continue to have the predisposition to see animism as no more than a crumbling start to something else deemed to be better or more, or more sophisticated or more advanced. However, new approaches on the part of academics and also non-academics actually, non-academics who are more interested in constructing a um, nature-venerating religion. So several attempts um, are surfacing and there is a, a clear new attempt to understand animism, not as something primitive, but as a worldview or a world perspective, highly complex and a, a continuous relationship between man and the world, very active, alive and practical which is undoubtedly the most widespread perception of history, uh, both geographically and historically speaking, right? Uh, the first attempts to describe animism, uh, not actually giving it this term, animism, not yet, but an attempt to describe or to uh, understand native spiritualities Europeans had come in contact with uh, during colonization, well, uh, the first attempts appear in the 18th century. Uh, very basically, still attempting to compare uh, native societies to the idea the Western culture still had 
of paganism and past cultures before Christianization. Always this attempt to see non-Christians as idol worshippers, trying to understand what were these figurines they had and the conception of local deities, the relationship towards animals and the, and the indigenous ideas of what Europeans perceived to be inanimate things. But the native peoples clearly shown a different approach, a more social approach towards seemingly inanimate things. So the idea was, from the part of Western cultures, that native peoples attributed to the world around them signs of human likeness, as the projection of imagination and a tendency to turn the world into a living poetry, a lot more metaphorical, as a fail in dealing with reality and projecting an almost dream state, projecting human likeness unto inanimate or dead things. And as such, indigenous beliefs were taken by the Western society as something that religiously and, ph and philosophically speaking were completely absurd, vulgar and ignorant. So these are the first studies on indigenous societies and their belief system from the point of view of what the Western society believed to be sophistication, enlightenment, progression, the civilized and no small amount of arrogance, of course, dealing with indigenous peoples as if they were children. So, of course, these first studies very much on the colonial perspective and the sense of superiority would have had great influence on future studies to the point that there was no need to get out there anymore and contact and have contact with indigenous peoples and just rely on the sources and continue to deal with this subject always in the same manner reinforcing reinforcing the same beliefs and perceptions in the mid 19th century until the first decade decades of the of the 20th century there was a growing interest on the religious past of Europe and the pre-Christian beliefs and religions and indeed culture in general of ancient Europe before Christianization. One of the great problems here was the fact that this growing interest in the European pagan past was to recover some sort of proof to legitimate the sense of nation. There were several romanticisms and also completely wrong notions of an European pagan past. And it wasn't actually an attempt to seek the actual historical truth, but simply to find anything that could slightly indicate a notion of an ancient nation and a self-identity, just to justify the right a specific territory had over another and therefore create a stronger sense of nation and to legitimize the, the claim over a territory to build a nation and build a self-identity. So all sorts of things were concocted, all sorts of academic works that highly need to be revised nowadays and, and some of them need to be completely put aside. But let's not enter there. One of the great problems here is that newly formed or attempting to form nations in European in, in Europe during that period were only interested in a past that continued to show modern notions of sophistication. Much of the studies relied on classical antiquity and all sorts of notions um, uh, of classical antiquity and nation and nations tried to find that same sort of sophistication and architectonic elegance in their own cultural past. So the focus wasn't on anything that slightly resembled something more primitive or, or modern notions of what was considered to be primitive. The Western world, by this period, the, uh, until the first half of the 20th, 20th century, was very much still inclined to a colonial mentality. So no one was particularly interested, actually, in acknowledging their past as something similar or that could be matched with the indigenous peoples they were still subjugating, whom they considered to be lesser, primitive, ignorant, unsophisticated, and underdeveloped. 
So the basic idea here by this period is that the Western world still saw colonized countries and their peoples as savages. So they were not particularly interested in finding their own cultural past th that had also been savage. There was a clear division here between the sophistication of the European pagan past and the indigenous peoples who were still considered as savages. So any study focused on European historical past was always trying to seek confirmation to the modern models of sophistication and modernization, whilst any study on indigenous peoples were still on the colonial perspective until the first half of the 20th century. Which is why animism in the mid 19th and the early 20th centuries was still considered something ignorant and vulgar by the Western society. Animism is seen in this period as the belief savages have towards the world and that they believe that trees and plants are alive. Everything is alive. The belief is that the savage believes that all things have a soul and therefore the savage treats all things accordingly, addressing or addresses things in a more social manner because of the belief that such things contain a soul. So you see, still loads of Western cultural perceptions and the fail to understand and to see past that, even the very conception of the soul of the Western religious mentality, which is not at all the same for many indigenous peoples and of course, animistic societies. So these studies, continued to insist on the same pejorative views towards indigenous peoples. These were works from Europeans to Europeans, not from indigenous peoples to Europeans or from indigenous peoples to indigenous peoples, and certainly not from Europeans truly inserted in an indigenous society with animistic worldviews. There were other approaches, of course, to animism during this period. Uh, well. Some approached the subject as animism being an earlier and primitive attempt from the part of humanity to understand the world they were inserted in. And um, as such, religion is a development from those primitivisms. But since indigenous culture still existed, seen as primitive and not as religions, that would be because they were simply surviving conceptions due to the inability of some cultures to evolve past that. Religion, on the other hand, was seen as something that would and should eventually disappear with the progression of sciences and the, um, the scientific explanations that by themselves would present evidences enough uh, not only to explain and eventually and with religion, but also on that same line of thought from that period, the scientific study of human cultures would uncover the survival animistic ideas within religion itself and point out the mistakes that earlier humans made, but had been unable to rectify such mistakes because science wasn't yet advanced. So we also had this panorama during the 18 and early 19th centuries uh, until the first half of the 20th century concerning animism and animistic societies. Since industrializations, industrialization, science was developing pretty fast and many people were relying a lot more on science to solve every sort of problems in their lives. Science was something quite new during this period because it had reached huge proportions especially in England during the Victorian era, when great technological advancements were making people's lives a lot better and their daily works facilitated. Science was becoming the new religion. So everything deemed to be primitive was just a question of time until science debunked all sorts of <laughs> human intellectual errors towards a more spiritual and religious perception of the world. Again, animism uh, continued to be seen as either metaphorical attempts to explain reality or 
childish, childish delusions of the human mind projected into reality. So, animism was still seen as something ignorant, vulgar, and completely absurd. And it's not surprising that it is during these periods precisely that we get a lot of pejorative terms to designate various indigenous peoples. And such terms all mean the same or point to the same idea as indigenous peoples being ignorant. Uh, let me give you a quick example. For instance, until quite late, as late as, as 10 years ago, actually, we still called the Sami from Sami, the northern, in Northern Europe, we still call them as Laps, from Lapland, a highly derogatory term, something between the lines of simpleton. And why is that? Because Scandinavian scientists measured the heads of Sami people, noticed that they were smaller or shaped in a different way. Therefore, they came to the conclusion that the Sami were simpletons, laps. Uh, another example, the term Eskimo, to designate Inuit peoples and put them inside the same ethnicity bag or ethnicity pot. <laughs> Eskimo is a very offensive and uh, deteriorating term, actually. So, you see, the perception of animism in indige indigenous societies on the various early fields of social human sciences, such as ethnography, anthropology, and archaeology, well, bloody amateurs. But fortunately, things changed in time, and these sciences actually became real sciences post-World War II. And there has been a considerable development, not only in the understanding of uh, the cultures of various indigenous peoples, but also on the perception and acknowledgement and awareness of different world views, such as animism and pre-Christian pagan past. But there were other fields taking steps in, into an understanding of animism as well, such as the field of uh, psychoanalysis with Sigmund Freud, uh, for instance, who ended up reducing animism and the belief in spirits and demons as merely projections of man's emotional impulses, in the belief that animistic beliefs were simply the projection of obsessions and internal emotional conflicts and projecting this into persons, populating the world with these persons that are no more than, pro than uh, projections from inner emotions. Of course, Sigmund Freud uh, elaborates this a little bit more, but this is basically his main idea towards animism and animistic societies. You can read it for yourself. Uh, yeah, and you can, you, you can come to the same conclusion, I'm quite certain. So, until now, as you can see, and I hope I was clear enough, I'm sorry, but for the sake of this video, I don't want to delve too much on this, but just a general panorama. So you can get the idea. Uh, but as you can see, until now, there were several inadequate ideas concerning animism. And the um, explanations of animism were only theories to explain the origins of a religion. And always regarded as something primitive, irrational and ignorant. As the first layer and the crude start to something more developed and sophisticated. Of course, uh, there are several developments concerning animism and, uh, and, and its understanding. And post-World War II, academics and scientists are a lot more immersed in indigenous societies and their belief systems. With the end of the World War II, uh, there is a crucial breaking of old mentalities, old conceptions. There is a considerable downfall in the sense of superiority from the part of the Western cultural world, especially from Europeans. Uh, to a certain extent, there is even a general fear of science and technology, which had greatly developed to make wonderful things, but also terrible things and new weaponry and terrible atomic technology that could devastate entire cities. After World War II, there is indeed a complete complete change of mentalities. After all, 
the Western world was completely shaken and its foundations were broken. There were new schools of thought, new approaches to society and its values, norms and rules. There was much doubt and fear and the need to seek new answers and better answers to the old questions and new answers to the new questions. So from the moment, that moment, post-World War II until our days, there has been a rejection of previous scholarly attempts to identify and understand animism. Even though the development has been quite slow, it is moving forward and it is evolving, not only in relation to animism, of course, but in the whole perception and, and beliefs we had of humanity's historical past. What we thought we knew has been questioned several times. And there's been wonderful new studies, new academic works in relation to everything. And I mean everything. We are in the, in the 21st century and we need to rethink everything we thought we knew about our own cultural past especially the European one. Scholarly works highly romanticized and politicized, biased, and always in the sense of superiority and very racist. New studies on animism and the great contribution of indigenous peoples who have progressively gained access finally to the scientific world as well. And in many European countries, fortunately, education is no longer the privilege of some. There's been a considerable progress in the awareness of animism. We start to understand that the animistic worldview uh, understands the world as being populated by persons. Some are human, but the great majority are non-human persons or more than human persons or other than human persons. But this doesn't mean that human likeness is attributed to other living beings and what we deem to be inanimate. It means that a person is a living being that demonstrates behavior, shows attitude, displays emotion, is capable of interaction, demonstrates self-awareness, expresses um, consciousness, and manifests sensibility. Therefore, a person is someone that can be interacted, interacted with, reasoned with, take advantage of, and form a relationship with. It's not the worship of idols, it's not the belief in spirits and demons, and it's not hugging trees and talking to rocks. It's a constant relationship between persons and creating a beneficial symbiotic relationship with persons, not only for the sake of survival, but to avoid catastrophe by maintaining a balance. And that balance is created as much as possible with a series of actions towards the persons of the world from whom we need something and they need something from us. Be that beneficial or simply to avoid disaster, harm, grief, and in general to avoid adversity or a cataclysm or a cataclysmic event within any society or culture a person is inserted in or belongs to, be that human person or non-human person, or more than human person or other than human person. So let's continue, please. Allow me to try to create a very, a very basic picture to better grasp an animistic behavior and perception towards the world. Let's pretend that there is a fire in front of us and the fire emanates warmth, has a purpose, also displays behavior, swings, dances, the fire feeds and burns and makes sound and expresses action and also purpose. You are in front of this fire and there is a multitude of actions to interact with the fire. Use the fire to your advantage or maybe actions to avoid the fire. You can get closer and warm yourself. You can cook food by using the fire. You can feed the fire and the flames and maintain the fire alive to have light, warmth, cooking food. You create a relationship with the fire. 
you hurt yourself in the in the flames. You know you should avoid uh, getting too close. You can use the fire for illumination and control the fire and let the fire burn on another surface and use that to carry around this fire. There are many actions towards the fire and this fire displays action, consequence and also behavior and attributes. It has attributes and, and it has purpose. Very, very basically, animism is also this, but much more than this, of course. Unlike what it was thought for a very long time, it's not a question of veneration. It's not a question of simply believing. Animism is highly practical. There are continuous actions towards the various persons of the world. There is no human world and nature there isn't that clear separation as we often do. Instead, there is only the world and everything is inserted in it and everything can and will interact with each other. A human person isn't above or below a non-human person. A person is a person. Therefore, whatever actions we have with one person, we can have with another person, no matter to what culture they belong to. This is the key point in here. It's not only the human person that has a culture and lives in a society and is capable of having a family and uh, extending relationships to other persons of that same society and culture. The world is populated with persons with their own societies and their own cultures. And since we share the same environment, interaction with the persons of the world is inevitable. There is exchange of behavior. There is the necessity of interaction. There is the need to create symbiotic relationships for the benefit of every person. Because each life, each life form matters. And each life form has a consciousness and specific behaviors, dreams and wishes and needs and actions. Just as the same way the human person acts towards something and differently according to every situation, other persons will do the exact same thing. Animism is action, it is behavior, it is a, a, a whole world view and the human person interacts according to the perceptions towards that same world view. Animism is highly practical. And notice that when I spoke of the fire, I did not refer to the fire as it, as a thing. That's another problem I might have to address on another video. Uh, the barrier of language. In most of our Western languages, we have clear designations to address something inanimate, uh, something we understand to be lifeless. Indigenous societies aren't so straightforward in their own languages when addressing something and either giving to that something a sense of being animated or inanimate or even giving a sense of identity. This doesn't mean indigenous societies don't have specific terms to address a thing. They do, but in Western languages, we have clear terms that demonstrates something inanimate, such as it. It is a designation of a thing, which is why I did not refer to the fire as it, as a thing, but simply as fire, because it's a person and not a dead thing. But this doesn't mean that in an animistic worldview, everything is believed to be alive, no. In indigenous vocabulary, they can address a rock in a, in a sense of being he or she or other words that clearly demonstrate animation, addressing a person, but they can turn to another stone just beside the first one they addressed as a person and, uh, and they address this second rock as an it, a thing, as it. Not every stone is alive, but some are. Animism is the ability to recognize what is a person and what isn't, what is animated and what isn't. 
And that is through the perception of what the person or the thing demonstrates. Again, uh, it is a person if there is behavior, attitude, emotion, interaction, self-awareness, consciousness, sensibility. But more on that and the case of indigenous languages on some other video. But the way we address things in our own languages, Western languages, in Europe and other societies, uh, is also crucial because from the moment we address something as a thing, as, as something inanimate, our language already creates a clear understanding of that thing. And even if it is alive, we will have a hard time understanding it because we have been conditioned by our own languages and have always addressed that specific person as a thing. Therefore, we fail in interiorizing that it's not a thing, even though we have no other term in our languages to address that person other than a thing, other than a it. So you understand the limitations of our own languages give us. The evolution of language accompanies the evolution of the human mentality and its perception towards the supernatural and the perception of the world and reality itself. From the moment the mind of the person is conditioned by a religion that dictates what is alive and what is not, or what is wrong and what is right, or what is real and what isn't, we develop new terms. We create new languages or evolve the existing languages to fit into the new perceptions. And therefore, our own languages give us limitations. And due to our vocabulary and the very perceptions the, the vocabulary creates in our mind, we will be restricted to see only what our vocabulary can acknowledge to be real. So let's start taking animism seriously, shall we? <laughs> As I said, animism is essentially practical. Cosmology and cosmogony are not a phenomenon solely of oral tradition, but in fact there is the necessity to express events within the human community. Often a reenactment of creational events within the human society to incorporate and express such powers and propitiate the continuation of the flowing of such powers within the community and in the rest of the environment, of course. Through the reenactment of creation, fertility, life, death, and other important factors that originate life and well being and a balance, the animistic individual awakens such factors in the environment. The world is filled with the energy and power of this reenactment, and such events are brought back and makes it possible to be repeated. Animism is rational due to its practical activity and the necessity to mimic the behavior of the persons that populate the world in order to create a better communication with such persons, a better understanding. And therefore, it is possible to maintain that communication and build relationships for the benefit of the whole. The animistic societies have a constant engagement with their environment. In this way, animism is not mythology solely or abstract philosophy, metaphor, symbolic representation or anything of the sort. Animism deals with things sensibly and realistically in a way that is based on practical rather than theoretical considerations. Animism is down to earth. It embraces and accepts the world. It is a world accepting view. What I'm saying here is that animism isn't like the usual notions we have of religion, which are based on the contemplation of events, and there is an abstract theoretical approach to what is observed. Rather, animism tends to be based on close contact, 
face-to-face -face experiences with the persons of the world, human or non-human or other than human persons. So it's not theoretical and abstract, but indeed based on experience. Animism is a worldview based on life experiences and being in contact, constant contact with the world, interact with it, being immersed in it. And it's very important to understand this so we can take animism seriously and understand the attitudes and beliefs and behaviors the indigenous peoples have about and towards the natural world and uh, towards beings, life forms, be those animal persons, spirit persons, ancestor persons, phenomenon and natural persons, and the relationships that are built among and between the various persons. I always like to give the example of the bear, the animal, particularly among animistic societies of the circumpolar regions, Arctic and subarctic. I have talked about this before in relation to the Sami, actually, from, from Sami. Uh, there isn't a clear line of thought separating the human from the animal, but rather the bear is seen as a person, it is the bear person. The animistic society deals with the paradox of having to kill to survive when there are no other options available at hand, such as fruits, vegetables, and all sorts of edible wild vegetations. Uh, trees, berries, roots, mushrooms, and so on and so forth. Killing an animal person within the animistic worldview often constitutes the paradox of having to kill another person and eating it, which by itself means cannibalism, which is a taboo in many societies and none more so than within animistic societies. If the animal is regarded as a person, the animist individual has a hard time dealing with that because if he needs to kill this animal person to eat it in order to survive, the animistic individual is killing a person such as himself. I'm not going to enter into details concerning this paradox, not today anyway, I'll leave that for another video, but it is important to take in mind that there are ways around this paradox, ways around the taboos and actions to mitigate the damage and the consequences of killing a person and eating the person. And also to prevent catastrophe and revenge from the part of the victim. This is when the bear person enters, which I find it to be one of the best examples actually to express the animistic mind and practical action. Bears hold powerful significance in the northern hemisphere. Among the Sami people, there are a multitude of elaborate rituals for accessing and securing the spiritual assistance of bears through their ritual consumption, which is actually a tradition shared by other Finno Ugric peoples in general. The Sami, the Sami bear hunt was preceded by offerings at the community's Seidi altar. As you well know, the Seidi is usually a rock with a particular shape. It has a specific spiritual but also religious connotation. But it could also be a piece of wood or even a wooden figurine, a clear cultural item of religious significance, and, and, and it also marks divine presence as well. At the Seidi altar of the community, a particular hunter was selected by divination methods, usually by the community's Noaidi, the, the spiritual leader of the Sami, as you well know it. Only the selected hunter was allowed to attack the bear, and the bear needed to be awakened before the attack to ensure that all of his wandering spirits, the wandering spirits of the bear, were all present at the time of the bear's death to be in the bear and not be detached from the bear upon death. After the killing of the bear, the bear was welcomed in the village as an honored guest. A series of ceremonies in honor of the bear uh, and the sacrifice that has been made. The bear is carried around like a person 
and is and 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 if it as if it were alive. The community eventually feasts on the bear's flesh, making certain that no harm comes to the bones, which after the ceremony and the feast were carefully carefully buried after another ceremony for the exact, for that purpose. So, so that the bear uh, might be reborn the next year, come again and take possession of the bones, right? So this is something very curious I'll talk about eventually dealing with the paradox I have addressed previously and the, the ancestors in animal form that constantly sacrifice themselves to feed their descendants and feed the human community, uh, the community of human persons. Anyway, uh, the bear is a frequent source of animistic power in Sami tradition. That's the point. This also happens among certain Siberian communities, to this day actually. And we can uh, draw parallels to better grasp these attitudes, these behaviors. Arctic and subarctic communities live mainly on reindeer and moose. So hunting bear isn't particular for food, but often to acquire the power or, and the help of the animal, or both. The bear is often believed to be filled with spiritual potency, which the human community sometimes requires to prevent specific catastrophes within the community or to reenact a particular event to continue to propitiate the spiritual powers emanating from such an event. So, because the bear is regarded as one of the most powerful animals in spiritual terms uh, within the circumpolar regions, there is the need for elaborate rituals and attitudes to prevent the breaking of taboo. Many of the hunters or the hunter generally tries to make the spirit of the bear believe that its death was an unfortunate event, an unfortunate accident, so, so that the blame won't fall on the human hunters and subsequently fall into the human community. They bow down before the animal and depending on each cultural group, of course, there is the presentation of respect and the speech towards the, the spirit of the animal to try to dissuade the spirit of the bear from taking revenge, appeasing the spirit. Or a whole story is told to make the spirit believe it was an unfortunate accident. The hunters are not to be blamed and the, the proper treatment will be carried out. There are a series of attitudes also towards the carcass, poking its eyes out to pretend that these are ravens doing their business. The hunter mimics the attitudes of other animals towards the carcass to try to disguise himself so the spirit of the bear isn't aware of the hunter. This mimic is not solely taken as a physical action, but also imitation of sound to be a lot more believable. The spirit of the bear is persuaded. There is an attempt to persuade the spirit and to calm it and to make believe in order to prevent anger and revenge, which will break the balance within uh, the human community, the community of human persons. In certain Siberian communities, the bones of the bear are also placed on raised platforms, the exact same way it used to be done uh, to the honored deceased persons of the human community. In the ritual, actually, if the ritual is violated, all sorts of terrible misfortunes will be triggered. So you see, the, the, the paradox of taking a life, be that for survival or for the acquirement of spiritual power or the necessity of having the aid of the spirit. A life is taken. Killing and death are not taken lightly because it is the breaking of taboo. It is the breaking of a life. And this attitude can cause serious consequences to the whole environment. And it will cause much suffering, not only for the human persons, but all the other persons as well. The breaking of the balance that existed before, the taking of a life may cause the spirit of the victim to take action and seek revenge. Now, 
imagine the billions of animals killed in the Western society and all over the world, actually, without this animistic attitude and the consequences towards the environment and uh, and and the uh, and the world that is dying because of careless human actions. There are taboos within the animistic society. There are rules, laws, clear rational attitudes and behaviors, ritualistic conduct, and the ability to create a relationship with the other persons. A relationship that is beneficial, a symbiotic relationship to prevent catastrophe in the world, which will eventually have, of course, impact upon the various communities of persons in the world. And it is also important to understand that within animism, it isn't a question of ha having a completely rhetor rhetorical approach when dealing with spirits and other persons. Not a question of following the rules in an absolute strictly manner. The point here is the ability, or at the very least, the attempt to create relationships with the spirits and other persons in the environment. The ceremonies are still performed, the rituals are still performed, but taboos, rules, and such other aspects of animism that constitute part of this mentality are guidelines, not a religious law, not the religious law. It is possible to go around the guidelines. The truly important aspect here is maintaining healthy relationships and especially creating friendships with certain persons in, or in, in order to have a better fluidity in life and enjoy life. With an animistic worldview, you engage with the natural world and the spiritual world and its persons. The same way you engage with the human persons you come in contact with. Some you avoid, others you get to know. A couple of human persons you are friends with, some are family, others are really, really your best friends, really close to you, and others you just have to deal occasionally or not at all. So this is the same way you, you, you will approach other persons in the natural world. In this way, animism should not perhaps be called animism at all, but should be called engagement because it is a constant engagement, oh, or perhaps not that word, not engagement, because native English speakers often use that word for other things. Um, right, uh, animism is an involvement, animism is, is an entanglement, that's what it is. <laughs> Immersing yourself in the world and the environment, uh, just the same way you involve yourself with others of your own species and of your own familiar environment. Exchange of contact. <laughs> it's not random and it's not delusional children running around talking to stones and hugging trees. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video and I sincerely hope it was useful. Take it as yet another introduction to animism, just so we might understand a little bit about where we stand on the comprehension of animism. There's still a lot of work to do, especially for us of the Western societies, of the Western cultural world. There's much to learn still, and I truly believe we are far from truly understanding animism, but we are finally moving forward and rediscovering our place in this world as persons that should again be immersed in the multitude of realities and cultures of other persons, both human and non-human persons and other than human persons and more than human persons. <laughs> this is just an introduction so I can move forward as well and share with you other realities within animism. So uh, it's always useful to have the basics so we can progressively venture into the understanding and knowledge of animism. Animism is indeed the type of worldview I believe we should embrace in order to understand the real impact we have upon this world and in the lives of other persons that populate this world. We have 
caused a lot of damage, and I won't try to deny or hide it. I believe we are already too late on a variety of things that will unfold in the next decade. But have hope. We will manage to survive, and uh, if we understand animism and help future generations interiorizing this worldview and let them be immersed into this world perspective of animism, eventually we can mitigate the damage until it's time to live again. Now, um, I'm really happy to see you are still in here with me. I'm glad you are alive and continue to keep me company uh, in yet another year. And I would like to have a moment of silence for those who departed. Not only due to COVID-19, of course, uh, but a lot of good people can no longer keep us company in this year. Family members even, and friends of mine. But yet again, with an animistic perspective, they are very much still around. I won't tell you to believe me. I just want to tell you that I wished you could see what is going on all around right here. It's just a question of perception and the capacity to reshape our mind and re-educate ourselves and reject what we have been taught to be real or not, what we have been taught to believe. So, as always, thanks for today. And if you please, a moment of silence. Thank you. Tak for det.